<laughs> good evening, everybody. So good to see you tonight. Uh, well, tonight we're going to be preaching out of the book of James, chapter 1, verse 19 and following. If you'd like to turn to that, uh, you will find it over after the Gospels and the Corinthians and all those. Can turn over to the book of James. James is the half-brother of our Lord Jesus, and, and uh, he was very important there in the early church. He pastored the early church there in Jerusalem. He was one of the leaders there, and, and so uh, he has a lot to say. <clears throat> now let me ask you a question before we begin tonight. I wonder what you and I would be like. What, what, would we, the, what would the world be like? Well, let's not go that far. But what would you and I be like if our lives weren't so polluted by the world's... Uh, by the world? What would we be like if we weren't so polluted? Now James tonight's going to talk about pollution. I, I got to think today about this, and I was wondering, would we have less temptation if we weren't so polluted? I don't know, but... The, I, I think we might. Uh, I think we'd make better decisions uh, if we weren't so polluted by the world. We'd get more accomplished for the Lord and probably just generally live a better life if we weren't so mixed. I'll talk about that just tonight. Now, the opposite of pollution is holiness. Yeah, I, I want you to get that because that, that's a very important way for you to understand what I'm talking about tonight. Holiness would be uh, someone who is completely one thing. Pollution would be something that's divided and mixed. And so to be holy uh, <clears throat> means to be uh, close to the Lord, not not much sin in your life, uh, and just being, it uh, means unmixed or, or pure. <clears throat> now most of us in southwest Missouri, we wouldn't go out to the creek and, and bend over and get us a drink, would we, out of the creek? Because we might get sick. Because why is it? Our old creeks are polluted around here, aren't they? And, and uh, we run so many cattle up on around them, and and uh, it, it's it's not. You just want to go drink out of the creek, not unless you were really ready for some some wonderful experiences to follow. <laughs> uh, now God is completely unpolluted. He's unmixed. There's not. We talked about last week. Remember, we said we, there's no shadow of turning. With him, he is completely one thing, unmixed in, in any way. Uh, there, he's just, in other words, there's just nothing else in God, but but who He is. There's no, there's no sin. There's no bitterness. There's no uh, uh, in, 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 innuendo. Nothing in Him. He's just pure, and we need to be like Him. He told us, you know, in the Bible, it says, "Be holy, for I am holy." We're to be more like Him. Now, before you get to beating yourself up too bad, holiness is not possible for a human being. I mean, we can we always strive for it. We should set as, our goal to be as holy as we possibly can, but <clears throat> we're kind of a mixed up group of folks. And sin is our, our common denominator in this life. So, But we strive for holiness. We strive to be like our Lord. And the better we are at that, the, the less... Uh, troubles we're going to have. Now, James, the book of James, was written just prior to several devastating things that were about to happen. You, you could, If you had been alive in James' time, by the way, this, this is written in about 50, and Jesus died in about 33, 34, and so you can see this is, uh, we're getting 10, 15 years down the road, and so uh, he lived in a very, very difficult time. They lived in a famine that was caused by a horrible drought. And uh, the Christians at this time were trying to decide what it meant to be Christians. What does it mean to be a Christian? How do you live? How do you act? How do you, uh, how do you make a, your, your life work as a Christian? Now, the reason they were dealing with these questions is because they had come from Judaism, from paganism, from all kinds of Roman cultish things and, and, uh, and Eastern things, mysticism, etc. And they were trying to figure out, well, okay, how does it, how does Christianity work? What's it like? What, do it, what does it do to me and how do I practice Christianity? So a lot of James' writing is written to us to tell us how to be Christians, how to live, how to think, how to act, how to, how to spend our time. <clears throat> In a few years after this time, the church had kind of a, the Holy Spirit gave a brand new idea to the church. And that was that the gospel is not just for Jews. Now, during this time, it hadn't dawned on them yet uh, that it was for everybody. 
They just, even James, I'm, I think, felt like that it was more of a, 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 a new area, a new kind of dynamic of Judaism. And they hadn't got the whole idea yet that Christianity was a universal worldwide gospel for everybody. Now, in a few years after this time, Rome's going to destroy uh, Jerusalem, where, where, the, where James lived. He's going to destroy that, that whole city. There's going to be thousands of people killed. The Jews are going to be scattered all over the planet. We've been talking about this, how that they were, uh, they, they've gone, they'll have to go everywhere to survive. And uh, that's just soon coming to, uh, to, the, to the world. Now, planet Earth is the place where the great battle between the, the, the forces of holiness and unholiness, that's where this battle's going on. And we were born right in the middle of it. You and I, we got here. Uh, we didn't uh, particularly want to, you know, decide to be in it. God didn't come to me and ask me, did I want to be born? Did he, you? I don't so I just showed up one day and discovered America and uh, and then I, I and tried to, to live in this world that's fighting over holiness and unholiness. And still yet, I, I don't know who's winning, but it's the battle still going on today. Now this war, where is it fought? Where's the battlefield? It's fought in your heart or your mind. That's where it is. It's inside you is where this war is going on. The devil wants you to be unholy. The Holy Spirit is calling you to holiness. And so there we're caught between the two. But who decides who wins? You do. You decide who wins. You, you knew I was going to have to tell this story, didn't you, about the, the American Indian. They found him sitting out on the, out the desert thinking... And the man asked him, said, uh, what are you doing out here? He said, well, I'm just thinking. He said, uh, uh, God, there's a war going on inside of me. And the man said, well, really? What kind of war is going on inside of you, chief? He said, well, <clears throat> there's a white dog and there's a black dog and they're fighting all the time inside of me. And the man said, well, chief, who wins the fight? He says, the dog I say sick him to. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the one that's going to win the fight inside each one of us is the one we say sick him to. Or the one we feed, the one we encourage, the one we we uh, we allow to to do that to us. So that war is going on. Now I'm, I'm going to say tonight that, that this is a hard thing for me to say uh, because I, it convicts me, and I and I hope that it makes you kind of wake up and think. Our level of holiness is a decision that I make and you make. We make that level. We decide how holy we want to be or how unholy we want to be. We make that choice. And you can't just make it one day and then be done with it. You've got to make it time and time again, over and over again. You have to decide who wins. Now, your soul and your spirit, now I don't want to get into a discussion out of the difference between the soul and the spirit. Let's just call it your, your, your inner man. That inner man uh, can be polluted. And, and we know that. But... What contributes to that? What makes me blue? What I know I decide. I, I know that. But what are the things that I do that add to it or contribute to it? And so James is going to answer that question tonight with his letter here, and starting in verse 19. And I think the first thing he's going to talk to us about is our words, our thoughtless words. The, the things we say that we haven't thought about. We just blurted them out. Anybody in here ever said something that you hadn't thought through <coughs> completely? Uh-huh. Not very much fun, is it? No. We all do it. So, But the thoughtless words that we that we come out of our mouth that we haven't thought through, we haven't prayed over, we just we just blur them out. And that can contribute. Let's, let's see what he says here. Verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Quick to listen and slow to speak. <clears throat> I love to, to talk to people. That's my life. That's all I've done all my life is just talk to folks and listen. And, and uh, I get so tickled when I'm having a conversation with somebody and I know they, they're not listening to a word I say. I know it. You know why I know? Because what they're doing is they're thinking about what they're going to say next. Yeah. <laughs> And you can just see it in their eyes. I mean, they're... Mm, would you hurry up and shut up so I can say one of them? <clears throat> we speak pollution into our lives. 
by the words we say. We literally do that. We say things that we wish we had that, that pollute, and it causes more pollution in our life. And, and, and we should always, I, here's kind of the little rule I try to live by, I don't always, but try to, always put your mind in gear before you engage your tongue. <laughs> right? Always put your, your mind in gear. Words have power. Has anybody noticed that? I mean, your words can take the, the hide off of somebody, or you can bless somebody. I mean, your words have tremendous power. And so we have to be really, really careful how we use them, what we say to each other, because, man, they're devastatingly powerful. Now, another thing about your words is that they will define you. They will tell people everywhere who you are and what you are or what you're not. Your words will, when you talk, people can look down into your soul by your words. Your words will, will tell them. I mean, they, you'll just paint a big old picture of who you are and what you're all about, what you think about when you talk. See? So we need to be very careful how we, we use our words. Now, your words can help or they can hurt. And sometimes they do both at the same time. You know, so you have to be careful. So practice listening and speaking very little. I've done this before, but let's do a little math. Are you ready to do a little math? All right. How many ears do you have? Most of us have two ears. How many mouths do we have? One. Well, then we should listen at least twice as much as we talk, don't you think? Right? Husbands, don't be an elbow on your wife now. I'll tell you. That's embarrassing to see that happen. <clears throat> now, the next thing we want to talk about is uh, uh, things that cause us unholiness, uh, cause that allow unholiness into our lives. And I think it's, I'm going to just put it simple like this, short fuses, just a short fuse. Uh, <clears throat> has, has you ever been around somebody that can just blow up with just... Uh, <clears throat> Let's read this. He says, at verse 19, the rest of it, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires or that God wants. God wants in your life, He wants righteousness to grow and to, to abound and to be abundant. And our anger or our short fuses uh, will, uh, will work against that every every time. There's a young man that had the problem with anger. He just flew off the handle. I mean, just didn't take anything to light him up. And uh, he flew off the handle at his dad one time. And his dad said, okay, son, now, uh, here's what I want you to do. We want to work on your anger. So every time you get mad real fast like that and fly off the handle, he said, before you do, I want you to go out behind the house and take a hammer and a nail and drive a nail in that oak fence out there behind the house. Anybody ever try to drive a nail in an oak board? Well, it's not hard. It's not easy to do. You'll bend the nail and everything. It's hard to do. But anyway, he said, okay, Dad, I, I, I'm going to try that. And so he, for a long time, he, boy, he just, he, I think they said he drove 37 nails in that the first day. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, but in time, it, you know, the, the practice of doing something before you flew off the handle kind of soaked in, worked its way into his life, and he began to, to react a little slower to being angry. And he's, one day he came back to his dad. He said, Dad, I, I don't know if you noticed, Dad. He said, but I haven't driven a nail the fence out there in three or four days. Dad said, well, good, son. You're making progress. He said, now what I want you to do is uh, I want you to go out there and I want you to pull those nails out once in a while. Right, go out there and just, you know, when you've had a good day and you've not flew off the handle, go out there and pull them nails out. And, and three or four months passed and he finally said, Dad, have you noticed that I pulled all the nails out of that fence back there? Dad said, yeah, that's, that's so wonderful. He said, let's go back there and look at that now. And then went after and he said, look at all the holes that's left here in this fence. Every time you drove a nail in this, you scarred the wood. And folks, that's what happens to us when we fly off the handle. We leave a hole somewhere that's going to be there a long time and uh, it's important that we, we get over that not, and not fly off the handle. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You are not doing what God wants you to do. It's not growing a righteous heart in you when you fly off the handle. <clears throat> I also have discovered that if you try to light a firecracker with a short fuse, you can become part of the explosion. 
Now, that's another thing that happened to you on short views. You get to be up close to the, to the top. Now, as I said, James is trying to tell us how to be a Christian. He's trying to define it. And he's working with his church there in Jerusalem. And he's and they wrote these things down. They're going to send this letter out to all the churches. And, and so, so James says, people, people, work on your short on your short fuses. Work on your temper. Learn to control that because it's not going to produce what God wants to do in your life. And in fact, it works against your soul and it leaves scars. So just keep that in mind. Now, the next thing I've discovered here, and as I look at verse 21, is uh, another thing that comes real close to, to me. I hate to preach on sermon points that get step on my toes. You know, I should just avoid them, I guess. But but I, I have a little trouble with patience. Does anybody in, in here else? Anybody side of me have a little trouble with that? Yeah, I, I noticed nobody raised their hands, but you smiled a little bit. Okay, let's read what he says there in verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Now let's talk about some of the words he used there. For instance, the word is morality. <clears throat> he says... Get rid of the moral filth. What kind of filth is moral filth? Well, it is the filth you do. It is it's action. It's bad stuff you've taken you've taken action on. It's not an idea uh, in your head. That's ethics. Ethics is the idea behind it. Morality is the action of it. Okay. So we can know in our mind. We can have the ethics in our mind. Well, it's not good to to fly off the handle. We can we can all say that's right. But when we fly off the handle, that's a moral infraction. And so he said, there, get rid of the moral infraction of this. Don't just think about it. Don't just say, well, that's, I know better. He says, don't do it. Because it works against God's plan, plan for your life. And he says, it, it pollutes your soul when we fly off the handle, when we lose our temper, when we step into and do something morally filthy, it, it, uh, it, takes, it pollutes our soul. And so James just says, get rid of it. Stop wallowing in it, he says. <clears throat> he says, because it's prevalent. It's everywhere. You can't get away from it. And it's readily available. <clears throat> now, what's the cure for it? James just tells us right there in that, that uh, text we just read. There's a cure for be, becoming involved in moral filth. And it simply is this. is uh, Accept the Word of God that has been planted in you. In other words, get close to the Word of God. Read it. Study it. Meditate on it day and night. Let the Word of God find its way into your heart. And it will help you push back against the moral filth that is so prevalent, James says. It, 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 James, he ought to live in 21st century America, if you think it's... If there, if, I think it was probably bad in his day, but man, he can't, it hadn't gotten any better. So God's Word is a hedge against that prevalent moral filth that we live in. So humbly accept God's Word. Un accept it. Let it come in and do its work. Because James says this. He says, because it can save you. Now, now, what does that mean? It can save you from falling into the moral filth trap. When the Word of God is planted in your heart, when it lives in there vibrantly and actively, and you, you work, it, work it out, let it work out in your life, then, it, then folks, it really does make a difference. Now, James is going to go in the next part of our study tonight. Is he's going to go <clears throat> to uh, to the application of of our knowledge? Remember, I said ethics is just knowing what you ought to do. Morality is what you do. And so James is going to say, don't just stop with the ethics. Go to the morality. Fix that. And let's let's look at, listen to what he said, verse twenty two. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. See, we, we do that. We deceive ourselves. We, we listen. We think, well, I've been to Sunday school. I've heard preaching all my life. I know what I should be doing. That's good enough. I know what I'm supposed to No, it ain't good enough. You can go to church all your life. You can be baptized in, in Ever Creek in Greene County and, uh, and still not, not know the Lord. You can still be a lost person. Don't just listen to the Word and deceive yourself. Do what it says. Now look at verse 23. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do it, what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. 
But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. The blessing is not in just knowing it. The blessing comes in letting it come at home and letting it live in your heart and letting it work out in your life and do the things it's told you to do. A blessing is promised to us. We're promised to be blessed when we do that. Now here's what we're to do with the Word of God. Here's what we're to do. Listen to it and do what it says. We've been saying about that. And keep on doing it. Listen to it and do what it says. And keep on doing it, James says. And it will give you freedom. Now James is going to go into an area now too that we need to think about very, very seriously. And it's going to get down pretty soon to the very heart of James' message. Because James is very big on social action. James says that your faith is not faith unless it makes you do something. You know, he's some people have, have uh, kind of gone to seed on James and not balanced it with the book of Romans about grace. But you've got to balance the two. But if you just listen to the book of James and you don't read anything else in the Bible, you can begin to think that your works are uh, more important than anything else. I believe grace is more important than anything else. But James, let's just see what he says here about this in verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Wow. He, he, just, he needs to come right out and say what he thinks, you know. Quit beating around the bush. Then he says, if you can't control your tongue, your religion is no good. It's worthless. And he's right. It's got to make you hold on to that. Let's look at 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Look after the orphans and the widows in their distress. So, <clears throat> James says that, that religion helps people. It does something. It helps poor folks. It lifts up the oppressed. It takes care of the disadvantaged and the marginalized people. It, it takes care of them. It loves them. And it blesses them. It doesn't just talk about it. Now, so what, what we need to know, to know about this is we've got to learn to keep a tight hold on our tongue. It says more about us than we want people to know. We have to watch it. And we need to take care of the people that can't take care of themselves. And we're responsible for that. One of the, my favorite texts in the Bible is that when Jesus said, when the question was being asked, uh, well, Lord, when did we help you? you, know, when you and he said, when you've done it to the least of one of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. So when you reach out a hand to somebody and, love, and, and give them a hand up and love them, You've done it to Jesus. You, you just you need to realize who that person is. Jesus comes to us disguised as a poor person, as a sick person. He comes to us disguised as somebody that's hurting and, and been pushed aside, mistreated. He comes to us in that disguise. And when we reach out, we're reaching out and embracing our Lord. We need to remember that. And then he says, and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. And that inner goodness that we will apply to in our lives by practicing and, and, and living our faith out, it keeps us from being polluted in this world. And we don't want to be polluted. We want to be one thing, unmixed. We want to be holy, just like the Lord. <clears throat> so I guess what I want to say is, make hey friends, work it. Work it. Don't just think about it. Work it. Make it. Put it to work every day in your life. And, and make it. Pick people up. Lift them up. And then watch your tongue and your moral... Uh, pollution. Lord, tonight,